Ladies and gentlemen, we make a start. Dear guests of the WRR, the Scientific Council for Government Policy, I welcome you to this 10th annual WRR lecture. Please allow me one Dutch sentence. We spreken vandaag uh, alleen Engels hier met elkaar om ervoor te zorgen dat iedereen, ook onze gasten, uh, alles kan verstaan, uh, aannemen dat u allemaal ook de Engelse taal meester bent en in de wetenschap en ook in het beleid uh, en de Nederlandse samenleving is die kans ook heel groot. Uh, the council is happy that so many of you are participating today in sharing advanced scientific analysis and intellectual creativity in relation to major global challenges. I especially welcome our outstanding guest speakers, Dr. Danny Roderick, Mr. Martin Wolf, Mrs. Shaila Sital Singh, who will present their knowledge and views on the topic pursuing national policies in a global world in crisis. No need to say that this is a highly relevant and topical issue. Democratic governance and political communities are still primarily organized on a national basis. However, economic processes and many of the most important problems and challenges the world is facing related to, for example, food, energy and sustainability are increasingly extending beyond national borders. And addressing global issues while respecting national structures and traditions is therefore a major and increasingly urgent challenge. And this is the more so uh, as, as we all know, uh, some years after the crisis of 2008, problems still have not gone away. Uh, and in Europe, we face serious problems in crisis management and steering with the financial economic problems seeming even greater than before. The concern on how to connect national and global interest has a prominent place in the working program of the WRR and is being addressed in a number of projects. And in this context, for example, the Council uh, also to develop the concept of extended national interests with a view on combining national strength with addressing uh, global challenges. Given all this, it's highly appropriate for the 10th annual lecture of the WRR to focus on the key question, how national interests and, go and goals can be achieved in a responsible manner in a globalizing world which is under pressure. We are looking forward to hearing the lectures of two internationally leading experts on this question. And after the break, uh, top Dutch economic journalists will give a commentary and this will be followed by a discussion chaired by Professor Peter van Hieshout, council member, uh, who together with Robert Wendt has prepared the program. After having asked you to switch off your mobile phones, as far as you haven't done that yet, uh, I'm happy now to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Danny Roderick. Uh, he is a Rafik Hariri Professor of International Political Economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. He has published widely on international economy, economic development and political economy. Uh, Professor Roderick is attached to the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research in London, and the Center of Global Development in Washington. He is also co-editor of the Review of Economics and Statistics, uh, and he's one of the most influential economists in the world. Among his books uh, are, has globalization gone too far? One Economics, Many Recipes, and very recently, The Globalization Paradox. Professor Roddick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, thank you, um, 
to the Council for the invitation. Uh, thank you all for, for showing up um, in this uh, rainy afternoon uh, in this wonderful, wonderful hall. Uh, it's really a privilege for me to be um, addressing such a distinguished uh, audience. Um, it, it's sort of um, interesting that it wasn't that many, that many years ago that we were talking about the end of history. Uh, remember that discussion about how market economy and democracy had, uh, had sort of reached the final stage um, and, uh, and, and, and there was nothing interesting was going to happen anymore. Uh, well, it's sort of hard to, to uh, avoid the feeling that we are actually living history right now, uh, day by day. Um, uh, clearly, uh, in Europe, um, with the developments in, in the crisis in the Eurozone, but also globally with the vast changes that are taking place. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the bad news is that capitalism is in crisis. Uh, the good news is that uh, capitalism has been in crisis before. Um, in other words, capitalism has survived crises. Um, one of the um, um, elements of capitalism that makes it so, um, <coughs> so, so robust is that it has a capacity to reinvent itself. And um, one of my themes today uh, is the, uh, the, the changing conceptions of capitalism uh, over the course of history. Um, sometimes uh, we have taken wrong turns, and I think our experience in the last couple of decades is suggestive of that. Uh, but the inherent flexibility of capitalism should remind us that it's, it's always possible to, uh, to set things back on, on the right course. Um, and, and what I hope I'll do is, is, is provide some ideas, or at least my ideas, on, on where I think we've gone wrong and, and what are some of the, uh, the key principles for how we can uh, be set back on track. Um, <coughs> Going back, sort of in a, in a very, uh, you know, uh, you know caricaturized um, capsule history, um, our oldest sort of conception of the market economy uh, is one that that goes back to Adam Smith, who had um, the fundamental insight that the uh, uh, market and therefore market economy uh, was the fundamental source of economic growth, economic uh, development, wealth creation. Um, and in the early conceptions of what a market economy required, a conception that still survives in textbooks, uh, in economic textbooks today, um, this system required really a very, very um, thin state, a minimal state, uh, even though this wasn't necessarily Adam Smith's own view. Uh, this is sort of the, the lesson that was internalized during the 19th century, uh, well into the uh, 20th. Um, and this was the, uh, the classical liberal view of, of capitalism. And it also uh, corresponds to the, um, a, a rather strong uh, libertarian strain uh, in the US as well, in terms of thinking about how you construct a market economy. It's one where you basically, uh, the, the public sector, the government plays uh, um, a role that doesn't go beyond simply uh, establishing property rights, enforcing contracts, and maybe doing uh, enough that's required for national defense. Um, this conception of uh, capitalism was replaced by a version uh, 2.0, um, which became the defining uh, feature of the 20th century, if you will, um, where the idea of uh, what a market economy requires in terms of institutional underpinnings, in terms of, of uh, uh, the role of the state, went way beyond uh, what was uh, in the original conception. Uh, so the key insight here uh, was that markets aren't necessarily self-creating, they're not self-regulating, they're not self-stabilizing, and in particular, they're not self-legitimizing. Um, and therefore, you need a whole range of institutions, um, <coughs> ranging from legal institutions to regulatory institutions to fiscal and monetary institutions to institutions of redistribution, to social policy, social insurance, and ultimately political democracy as well as probably the key institution of, uh, of uh, to stable to, to legitimize market economies. In practice, the form that this kind of capitalism took uh, in most of the advanced industrial economies, as well as many in the developing world uh, in the 20th century, can be uh, you know characterized as Keynesian economists. Keynesian economics plus welfare state plus industrial policy to restructure economies. Um, and that was a fairly uh, successful recipe for quite some time. Um, 
uh, it was a recipe, it was a version of capitalism that was inherently national. Uh, it wasn't a global one. In fact, the Bretton Woods regime, uh, which was uh, the version of globalization that, um, uh, that, that, that went ahead, that went uh, uh, along with this conception of capitalism, uh, actually <coughs> uh, was, uh, foresaw a ra rather limited uh, integration of, of national markets. Uh, of course, financially, financial globalization was limited. Um, capital controls were the rule rather than the exception. Uh, and even though world trade expanded quite rapidly uh, under this national system of capitalism, uh, the global rules on trade uh, were actually very flexible um, and hardly enforceable. Uh, so that in fact there was a very thin layer of global rules um, and leaving considerable room for maneuver for nation states, for domestic policy reasons, uh, for policy uh, to in fact practice Keynesian counter cyclical policies, uh, for each country to erect their own version of the welfare state, and for almost every country to restructure their economies and engage in fairly extensive industrial policies with few constraints uh, from, uh, the, the, uh, from, from um, international uh, rules or global uh, multilateral organizations. Starting sometime in the late 1980s, perhaps early uh, 1990s, we, uh, we uh, moved into a sort of a, a rather different conception of what uh, the next stage of capitalism required. And the key idea here uh, is that since globalization had, had um, progressed apace during the Bretton Woods period with uh, investment flows and trade expanding quite rapidly, um, that one needed to um, do one better, to enhance and deepen globalization much further, and that, in fact, required uh, eliminating all kinds of transactions costs on international trade and finance, um, and those weren't simply the bo barriers at the border, such as import tariffs, import duties, or restrictions on cross-border capital flows, but also it it required doing away uh, with uh, differences in regulatory regimes across countries that created jurisdictional discontinuities, acted as impediments to international trade and capital flows. Um, and so therefore, the, the new rules of financial globalization, of free capital, mo capital mobility, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and standardization and harmonization of, of uh, capital adequacy requirements and bank regulation on the one hand, and um, the, the disciplines in the World Trade Organization, the new disciplines that uh, went significantly beyond the border, reaching into countries' patent rules, into their subsidy rules, into their uh, investment rules, um, uh, uh, were part of this agenda of uh, reaching a, a more full-fledged, a more complete economic globalization. I think this, um, this version um, of capitalism had a fatal flaw. Uh, its fatal flaw was that uh, it substantially weakened or implied the weakening of domestic governance and regulatory mechanisms uh, so as to reduce these impediments to international trade and capital flows, while at the same time their global counterparts remained incomplete. Um, and that cr created both economic costs and political costs. The economic costs were rising inequality and um, a series and cycles of financial crises due to the poor global regulation of financial markets and a pattern of uneven development with countries that most closely followed the new rules actually doing worse than countries like China that actually decided to play the globalization rule by globalization game by the older Bretton Woods rules instead. The political cost of this model uh, was the sense that domestic electorates, domestic constituents, were significantly losing their access to uh, points where policy was being made, raising concerns over domestic legitimacy, growing inequality, and uh, generally the lack of uh, evenness or lack of levelness of the playing fields. Uh, arising from uh, differences in various kinds of, of labor standards, environmental standards in, 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 uh, in, in, in different national settings. 
Um, Europe for a while looked like the exception that would um, uh, test the rule in the sense that uh, it embarked on a process of economic integration that had a substantial institutional underpinning, process of institutional integration at the same time. Uh, yet, as I'll come back to in a few minutes, it turned out to have been not enough. When we view the history of uh, economic globalization uh, through this evolving stages of our conceptions of how market economy and the state fit, we come to what I call the, the political trilemma of the world economy. Um, the 19th century gold standard view of globalization essentially strived to achieve significant amount of globalization, what I call hyper-globalization, that is the minimization of transactions costs associated with national borders, along in a system where national sovereignty was still globally divided, um, um, in a system that Tom Friedman has called the golden straitjacket, uh, referring uh, to the gold standard. Um, and what the gold standard model did, it narrowed domestic political space, do domestic policy space in the macro, financial, tax, and structural and other domains to minimize impediments to the free flow of capital and goods. Uh, what that system deliberately excluded uh, was part popular mass participation from popular groups who might have different ideas about what domestic policies might uh, what shape those might take place. In fact, the collapse of the um, classical golden standard in the interwar period when Britain was forced to go off the gold standard is a classic case where a domestic sovereign faced between having to um, obey the rules of the gold standard and responding to the needs of its newly mobilized labor and other popular classes ultimately chose to go with the latter and went off gold so it could relax monetary conditions and um, reduce interest rates. The Bretton Woods regime, having learned the lesson from the gold standard period, which is that you couldn't hem uh, the policy space and national sovereigns maneuvering room too much in this new mass democratic age, in fact, that was one of the key lessons that Keynes took with him to the Bretton Woods Conference. Having learned that lesson, uh, arrived at a different equilibrium where democratic politics and national sovereignty were, was, were combined, albeit at keeping hyper-globalization at an arm's length, at an arm's distance. Uh, as I said before, we see this uh, in the rules of the IMF and the rules for the international financial market, which, as Keynes at the time said, capital controls are going to be with us as a rule, not just as a temporary expedient, because he understood that that was critical for maintaining room for domestic macroeconomic policy. And the GATT model in trade, as I again said it before, entailed a very thin layer of regulation essentially leaving much of world trade and certainly all of developing countries and agricultural trade and services outside any rules whatsoever. The essential problem of the post-1990 model was that we pushed for a hyper-globalization uh, without the institutional infrastructure. Um, and this model created failures of legitimacy uh, in areas where global rules went in fact too far, such as in trade with the World Trade Organization, and created problems of regulation, where in fact they didn't go far enough, and global finance was uh, a key example of that. So the fundamental problem of the world economy uh, in the years leading up to the current crisis was this imbalance between the reach of markets, increasingly global, and the scope of their governance which, by and large, still remained mostly national. The temptation to think of a real 3.0 version of capitalism is to say, well, why don't we construct version 2.0 at a global scale that would essentially entail a version, a thick version of global governance, 
where we remove the regulatory apparatus and the mechanisms of political representation and accountability all the way up to the global level. So that would imply combining hyper-globalization and democratic politics and doing away with national sovereignty altogether. The problem with that, of course, is not only that it is highly impractical, it places way too much faith on the supply of global leadership and the willingness of countries to give up their national sovereignty. Much more importantly, it's also undesirable. So the substantive argument against this thick model of global governance is that diversity in national preferences over the shape that regulatory and other institutions ought to take, this diversity in preferences is something that's real and harmonizing them away uh, isn't necessarily to the interest of the individual constituent units. So countries might have different preferences over what their corporate tax rates might be, uh, different preferences over what the scope of their welfare state ought to be. They may choose a different trade-off between financial innovation and financial stability. Uh, developing countries need to promote their structural transformation through various policies that might entail transactions costs on international trade and finance. So both because countries have different needs as well as because they have different preferences, uh, a model of thick global governance that assumes that a lot of these differences in institutional regulations uh, can be harmonized away is, uh, uh, in my view, undesirable. Nonetheless, this um, triangle here, this trilemma, describes, I think, the choices that, that the world economy confronts in the form of um, having to pick two out of the three. Hyper-globalization, national sovereignty, democratic politics. We have a choice between two out of the three. Historically, we've experienced the Golden Strait Jacket, we've experienced the Bretton Woods Compromise. We've tried to push for something like golden, uh, global governance and we have fallen far short. And having been caught somewhere in the middle of this triangle accounts for both the uh, economic and legitimacy problems, I think, of, of globalization. Now, the European Union, uh, as I said earlier, tried to construct, or at least one version of what the European Union is, is that the European Union tried to construct a version of this global governance model at the regional level. Indeed, the European Union went much further than any other part of the world economy in terms of creating new institutions at the regional level to underpin an integrated regional market. The European Parliament, the European Commission, the European Council, the European Court of Justice, which did an incredible amount of work to get the single market to be, make it a reality, the acquis communautaire, um, with hundreds of thousands of pages, and of course, common monetary policy and a common currency in the context of the Eurozone. Um, yet, with hindsight, perhaps, we understand how incomplete even this impressive set of institutional achievements were, um, which um, has left the EU very badly exposed to the crisis. Um, as <coughs> the way that, that this incompleteness is described by my uh, um, political scientist colleague at the, um, Boston University, Vivian Schmidt, is that the EU ended up with policy without politics, and each nation state was left with politics without policy. Now, a non-Eurosceptics interpretation, and that would be my interpretation, would be that there was a conception in Europe, and more narrowly in the Eurozone, of moving towards ongoing institution building and completing these sets of institutions eventually uh, underpinned by the development of a political community and a political union as well. Uh, but that the European Union's misfortune is that the financial crisis caught it midway in this process of institution building. Um, if we want to look at comparisons, let's remember that it took the United States more than a century to complete its own economic and political union, a very, very bloody civil war somewhere in between. Um, so this sets into perspective the very difficult task that the European Union had, enga had engaged in during this building, during this period. 
we see the differences of what this institutional incompleteness implies by simply comparing how a financial crisis plays out in the Eurozone versus how it plays out in the United States. Greece is a tiny part, tiny part of the entire European or Eurozone financial system. It accounts for around 4% of the external to the total liabilities of the Eurozone system. Um, so the fact that Greece on its own going down, in fact, maybe even some of the other countries going bankrupt would have a huge effect of the kind that we're experiencing today uh, can only be explained by this institutional incompleteness in the European context. Compare a country like Greece with a constituent part of the United States such as California or Florida. California shares a common currency with the rest of the US as well. Um, but when, let's say, the state of California becomes insolvent, just like the Greek government has become insolvent, there are a number of mechanisms that are pushed into play. Uh, Californians, residents of California, automatically get transfer payments, welfare checks and other uh, um, kinds of support directly from Washington. Um, borrowers in California, such as Californian banks, do not necessarily get shut out of credit markets because they do not face they operate under a federal legal regime, and therefore they do not face the kind of sovereign credit ceiling that banks in uh, Greece do, regardless of the health of their balance sheet. Of course, the Federal Reserve stands ready to lend uh, and act as a land of last resort to any Californian bank. And very, interesting, very importantly, Californian interests are represented in Washington, D.C., and therefore, Californian representatives in the House of Representatives or Senate can argue for California's interests in Washington, D.C. in terms of economic policy that Washington ought to follow. And of course, Californians can move a lot more easily across state borders uh, because of, of fewer problems of, of language barriers, cultural barriers, and so forth. Now, in return, there is in fact no expectation that Washington, D.C. will bail bail out the government of California. And the subtle point here is that Washington DC's or the federal government's no bailout commitment is rendered credible by in fact the supports that the individual Californian residents get directly from the center. So that means that since the transfer payments go directly to Californian residents, um, the economic and political fallouts of the bankruptcy of the state of California remain quite limited, and therefore there's no, not the same amount of political pressure necessarily to bail out the state of California at the same time. To summarize, because the state of California effectively has no sovereign powers, unlike Greece, it effectively is just like any other borrower in the American context. So the quid quo quo in the United States is that Californian residents are and feel like they are part of a larger political community and governance structure in Washington. And in return, the state of California has given up its sovereignty and has accepted the reach of federal laws and regulations. Now, but this is a two-sided quid pro quo that we need to bear in mind when there are discussions about a fiscal compact or fiscal union in the Eurozone today, where it's only one side of this quid pro quo that is being discussed, namely the stronger countries deciding on the fiscal rules or the penalties that the weaker countries are going to be having to face without much discussion of the political side of the quid pro quo, which is representation by all countries in the fiscal decision-making structures at the center. So in other words, creating this broader political governance regime at the center. So the Eurozone version of this trilemma is that increasingly countries like Greece are being pulled into uh, the golden straitjacket version of this trilemma, uh, where they are being ruled by technocratic decision-making processes. Um, but if we do not want to leave democracy at bay, 
if we believe in democracy, there's really only uh, two solutions left. One is the um, regional equivalent of the global governance model, which would be fiscal and political union at the level of Europe. Or if that is not a reality that um, German voters or Dutch voters for, the, for that matter are willing to accept, if German and Dutch voters in fact do not feel that they are part of the same political community or do not want to make that commitment to be the same part of political community as the Greeks and the Italians and the Portuguese, I think the only other alternative is the Bretton Woods Compromise end, which is really um, a easing up on the economic union, a breakup of the Eurozone. So the real choice is that the Eurozone either needs more political union if it wants to really remain an integrated single market or less economic union uh, in a dissolution of the Eurozone if it is unable to achieve political integration. And I think the, 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 the quicker a decision is made on which of these two, um, assuming that democracy isn't the one that's going to be sacrificed. I think the better and less, the least, least costly it's going to be for Europe as a whole. I want to um, end my comments with uh, a little bit more on the tension between democracy and globalization that um, I have been referring to, just to make sure that, that uh, I am not misunderstood. Uh, this tension is, I'm going to argue, is a somewhat subtle one, and we shouldn't be deluded into being pushed into the crude version of uh, the tension. First, let's be clear what hyperglobalization or full marketing integration, full economic integration really entails, what I've called hyperglobalization. It's the absence or the minimization of transaction costs on international trade and finance. How do you minimize? these transactions cost? Well, that requires a commitment on the part of nation states not to impose restrictions at the border on goods, services, and financial transactions. Second, beyond that, there are behind the border restrictions that are entailed, such that countries must harmonize their monetary, legal, and regulatory regimes so as to minimize the transactions costs that arise from jurisdictional discontinuities whether those are different monies or different product safety rules or different rules with respect to the taxation of capital. And third, further, governments must also credibly pre-commit pre -commit to not deviating from these harmonized regimes because even the expectation that national sovereign may depart from these rules in and of itself creates the transaction costs uh, and reduces market integration that, that hyperglobalization aims to achieve. Now, in this context, where does the tension arise? Saying that economic integration restricts national policy space, I think is not a valid criticism on its own uh, because there are all kinds of ways in which democracies actually actively restrict their freedom of maneuver, their own autonomy. There is something, there's a, there's, there's a principle of democratic delegation democratically elected bodies may choose to delegate authority uh, to autonomous regulators or other bodies. There's always checks and balances. And of course, globalization can make it easier for national democracies to attain goals that they pursue, even though it might imply some restrictions on policy space. I think the conflict arises only when globalization restricts the domestic articulation of these goals without a, without a compensating expansion of democratic space at the regional and global level. Uh, it's then when I think the, the, the opportunities for the tension to become real are the greatest. Globalization can enhance in democracy in a number of ways. And um, in an article by uh, Kohen, Macedo, and Moravchik, uh, these authors talk about democracy enhancing multilateralism. This is referring to the idea of how global rules or multilateral rules, let's say in the pers pursuit of some kind of globalization, can actually improve the performance of democracies. Uh, this can happen by offsetting the 
adverse effects of factions, special interests. It can happen by protecting minority rights or by enhancing the quality of democratic deliberation. In each one of these cases, we can find specific examples of how existing rules have actually potentially enhanced the functioning of democracy. So that, for example, the requirements of transparency or full domestic deliberation naturally um, limits the power that special interests might have. Um, on the other hand, we can also think of many other examples where international rules actually do precisely the opposite, that they create or empower special fractions, such as when financial interests um, get a disproportionate say in designing uh, Basel rules on capital adequacy. Um, they can, in fact, undermine the domestic legal regime as when bilateral investment treaties or special investment investor protector rights regimes um, actually uh, create a dualism between the rights that domestic investors have and the rights that foreign investors have. And in many cases where the requirements of WTO or the IMF or other external agencies are used to cut off or, de or, or derail domestic deliberation over ec economic policies, uh, such rules, rather than enhancing the quality of domestic de democratic deliberation, actually work to undermine them. So this is ultimately an empirical issue. Just as globalization can enhance democracy, it can actually, um, in, in, it can also uh, undermine it as well. The point, however, is that if we think about the kind of globalization we want as democracy enhancing globalization, and that would be a desirable normative goal, they would have to fall far short of hyper-globalization. Yeah. So there is an important difference in principle and in substance between the pursuit of hyper-globalization, which would justify any and all external rules that restrict domestic policy space so as to minimize transaction costs at the border, and democracy-enhancing globalization, which imposes only those mostly procedural restrictions such as transparency, accountability, representativeness, use of scientific evidence, and so on, that enhance domestic deliberation or are consistent with the principle of democratic delegation. So this is a rather different way of looking at how we want to construct globalization um, that puts democracy first and center and says that if domestic political structures are malfunctioning for whatever reason, and therefore each individual country is arriving at economic policies on any area that seems to be dysfunctional, that actually the best way to fix those aren't necessarily going to be through external imposition, external rules, international agreements, but rather through making domestic deliberation, domestic democratic processes work better. And can international rules, can multilateralism actually help there? Yes, it can. But as long as those rules are viewed in terms of creating those, establishing those procedural requirements rather than creating common standards or harmonizing away uh, regulatory differences. It's not clear whether the European Union will ultimately make this leap into political union. It may very well be too late, um, which I think unfortunately leaves only uh, the two other less desirable options on the table. And the main lesson of the Eurozone and the European Union for the world economy at large is that if it has proved so difficult for this region, for the Eurozone, to create the institutional underpinnings of economic integration, of single market at the regional level. It's going to be so much more difficult for the rest of the world as a whole to achieve that. And therefore, the lesson, I think, is that we need to moderate our ambitions on the reach of global governance. <laughs>
and create space for national governments, national institutions to provide the needed uh, um, governance functions. <clears throat> I don't think this would necessarily be the end of global cooperation. It wouldn't be the end of globalization for the very simple reason that when we argue that countries ought to follow open economic policies, that they should remove trade barriers, they should welcome capital flows, as economists, our main argument as to why they should do that is that it's good for them. These are supposed to be policies that are good for each country for themselves. So if in fact every country is following the, per the, the policies that are in its own interests, the world economy will end up being a fairly open economy at the same time. So it's not to say that there aren't issues such as global external imbalances being um, uh, the key area where there are very significant first order spillovers from what a large country like the China is doing and its effect on the rest of the world. And those are areas where uh, global rules are certainly needed. But in many other areas such as in financial regulation and in world trade, I think we have become much more ambitious and have gone way beyond uh, areas where such spillovers are first order um, and these areas are very different from an area like global climate change, and we sometimes use the misleading analogy, just like global climate is a global public good, only global cooperation can get us out of hell, uh, that the global economy is similarly a global public good, only global cooperation can get us to a good outcome. Well, that's not true, because as I said, unlike in the case of global uh, climate change, where the spillovers are first order, where global climate is a truly public good, the world economy, each, in, each country's own economy is actually a, a semi-private good, that if each country actually does what, does what is in its own interest, uh, we, get a pre, we get a world economy that functions pretty well to begin with. And if, as I said earlier, domestic policy-making processes are working poorly so that countries are pursuing economic policies such as high protection, high agriculturalist protections, for example, that seem to hurt their own economic interest. I don't think the way to deal with that is through global disciplines, but simply through improved deliberation at home and the way in which external constraints can help domestic deliberation is the way that, that I briefly sketched out before. So the final point is that we can indeed combine globalization and democracy, but that needs, that requires us that we recalibrate the way we think what global governance does and what it ought to do and what the global rules ought to be pursuing. Um, and that's what I've called democracy enhancing globalization, where international rules and disciplines are justified first and foremost, except in those areas where there are first order spillovers international rules and, um, and, and disciplines are justified first and foremost on the basis of whether they enhance domestic deliberation rather than on the basis of whether they limit or reduce transactions costs associated with the border. Thank you. <laughs>